Please open in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke 2, and if you stand, I'll be reading verses 1 through 20. Very familiar passage for us concerning the nature of the coming of Christ. Really, as we discussed last week, this is the fulfillment of the prophecies made that there would be a Messiah. And so this morning, we're going to talk about the present Messiah. We talked about the promised Messiah. This morning, the present Messiah, that is the celebration of his coming to be God with us. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. In order to register, along with Mary, he was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone about them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then, and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry, and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. Please be seated. Now, the Old Testament, written hundreds of years before Jesus' birth, contains over 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled through his life and death and resurrection. Mathematically speaking, the odds of anyone fulfilling this amount of prophecy are staggering. Mathematicians put it this way. One person fulfilling eight prophecies would have about a one in 100 quadrillion chance of actually happening. One person fulfilling 48 prophecies would have a chance of one in about 10 to the 157th power, a number that really doesn't even have any meaning to us. If you were to take all the electrons in in the universe or, or fill the entire mass of the universe with electrons, mark one of those electrons, blindfold someone, and ask them to pick it out on the first try, that would be the odds that we're talking about. It really is is meaningless. I mean, the, the odds are impossible. But then one person fulfilling 300 plus prophecies, only Jesus. Only Jesus. The world is in need of a savior, but not a military savior, a political savior, an environmental savior, or a social justice savior. They need a true savior. The one promised and predicted in the Old Testament, the one who would save his people from their sins. And the fact that the Messiah was promised in the Old Testament is not a small matter. No one can deny that the Old Testament was written before the events that the New Testament describes. Thus, any promise or prediction that is fulfilled becomes a testament to the supernatural reality of Christ's birth. Here's an apologetic for Christianity that is contained entirely within the scriptures. It needs no external logical reasoning or philosophical debate. The only way the reality of the supernatural prediction can be explained away is to say either that Jesus was never born, which is impossible historically, or to say that all of these events were manufactured by the New Testament writers. Now, this, of course, is possible, but it requires an active disbelief that rejects the reality of the existence of these manuscripts, the testimony of human history, the testimony of human nature, the testimony of creation, and the testimony that God has placed within the hearts of every man. Yes, believing in Jesus as the Messiah who saves us from certain punishment in eternal hell by granting us his righteousness on the basis of repentance and faith does require the exercise of faith. But it is a faith attested to by the reality of all that we have discussed in the strongest possible way. The joy of this Christmas time is that we celebrate a real Messiah 
provides a real salvation to real sinners that was predicted by real writers a real long time ago. What we'll see this morning is that Jesus is the king, a promised Messiah from before the beginning of time, whose birth and life are the fulfillment of specific promises made to prepare his people for his coming. Jesus is the king, a promised Messiah from before the beginning of time, whose birth and life are the fulfillment of specific promises made to prepare his people for his coming. The birth and life of Christ fulfill every detail of every promise made about him. Now, last week we looked at only 13 of those promises, 13 different promises and predictions of the Messiah in the Old Testament. Today, we're going to look at those same 13 promises, but now we're going to see how they were explained and fulfilled in every detail by the writing of the New Testament. And remember, only 13, well, we're cheating a bit, contained in those 13 are others. So maybe we're getting 15 to possibly 20 promises this morning, but there are over 300. We're only only touching the surface of this. And maybe you did your homework last week and you went home and said, where are those, where, where was that in the New Testament? And maybe you found them all. So this will just be a review for you this morning. But probably you didn't. So I'm going to take you on a, a, a trajectory from Matthew to Revelation. We've covered Genesis through Malachi. Now we're going to cover the rest of the Bible. Two sermons, the entire Bible covered. And you thought that I couldn't move quickly. <laughs> so as we look at these, you will notice that the outline is different if you're comparing it with last week, so you can't just pull out the same outline and just read through it. Because last week it says the Messiah was, this week it says the Messiah is. And so we're talking about the present Jesus, the one who came in history, yes, but is present with us now. And we are really celebrating what? History this morning. In two days, you will sit and with your family, you will celebrate the greatest gift of all, the Lord Jesus, by giving gifts to one another. And what a blessed way to do that. This drives me crazy when people are all bummed out about giving gifts. Well, why should you give gifts? Jesus is the greatest gift. Well, that's the reason. We give gifts because we've been given a great gift, and our great love for others causes us to want to to pour out our, our love upon them. And we do that, sure, with temporal, physical gifts, but hopefully much more than that, with the gift of love and grace that those very gifts represent. You don't give gifts to your children. Say They open it up and go, see, there, got your gift. It's my love to you. I love you and care for you, so I give you this gift. Well, in a much greater way, of course, the Lord Jesus was given to us as the greatest possible gift and promised at the earliest possible time, really at the best time, the promise of the Messiah was first made in Genesis 3.15 in the middle of the curse. Eve had eaten the fruit. The serpent had deceived Eve. Adam had taken from his wife, and they had fallen into sin. The entire universe plunged into darkness and plunged into destruction. And in the middle of that, in Genesis 3.15, as we looked at last week, God makes a promise, really, in the midst of this curse. He makes a promise to all of us as he curses the servant. So go ahead and turn there. We'll begin again in the Old Testament, but we'll be quickly moving to the New Testament. So be sure to be ready. Lots of pages turning this morning as you move with me. Really, we'll go from Genesis to Revelation, I guess, this morning. Genesis 3.15 in the middle of this curse, as he first curses the serpent for, what, for deceiving Eve, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. As we discussed last week, this really contains within it the seeds of, of all of the promises of the Messiah. That is that he will come, he will be born of a woman, he will be of the woman's seed, but he really will come from a line of those who acknowledge and who have, who, have, who have claimed God as their rightful master and ruler. And yet it also predicts that there will be an entire different line, the line of the serpent, the seed of the serpent, who will in fact be in, in opposition to the seed of the woman, will seek to destroy them and ultimately seek to destroy the seed who comes, the promised Messiah who would come to crush the serpent's head. And even here, right at the very beginning where it says, I will put enmity, that is an implacable, ongoing hatred between you and the woman. He's speaking to the serpent. And there's some who have said, I mean, that's just, it was just an animal. It was clearly an animal that was in the garden. So the serpent is more crafty than all the animals. And we see that even this animal is given a particular curse that it will go crawl in its belly as opposed to whatever it did before. We don't know exactly how it moved about before. Maybe, Maybe it flew, we don't know. So there is a specific promise or really curse here given to an animal. Why would we consider that to be Satan? Well, we consider it to be that because of the New Testament. 
The New Testament really reveals to us the nature of who this serpent actually is. And of course, that's what we do. That's the way we do our hermeneutics, our, our study of the Bible. The science of studying the Bible causes us to realize that in the Old Testament, you have Christ, but he is concealed. He is in shadows and types. And in the New Testament, he is then revealed. And the beauty of it is, is we don't have to dig into the New Testament and try to figure out, well, I wonder what it said about the Old Testament, or I wonder where Jesus is, because the New Testament makes it very clear. There's all hermeneutics in our day today that says we have to somehow look into the Old Testament and try to dig up things about Jesus, and we're not, you know, we're not even exactly sure. Maybe the New Testament tells us exactly what about the Old Testament predicted Jesus. And, of course, it says this about the serpent. In John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. What beginning? This beginning, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Who told the first lie? Where was it told? It was told here in Genesis chapter 3. He lies to Eve and he says, first has God said, and then Eve says, tells the things that God has said, and Satan says, that is not true. You certainly will not die. The first and greatest of all lies. That if you disobey God, there is no consequence. Where have you heard that lie before? In all of history, every day, throughout the rest of history, and you hear it trumpeted today. There is no consequence to denying God, to disobeying God. It's a fundamental lie that Satan tells. And the greatest of lies because there is a consequence. And it is an eternal consequence. And it is eternally suffering in hell punishment for sin. What a lie. Satan is the father of lies, the serpent with Satan indwelling him, certainly speaking through him, tells this first lie. And then even more clearly in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, is there is really a pictorial representation of Genesis 3 and the battle that's been down throughout the ages, real events happening, but described in metaphorical terms. It says the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, there you have it, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan who destroys the whole world. This is the serpent. First mention of any serpent in the Bible is here, Genesis 3. And so in Revelation 12, it's wrapping things up and, and, and displaying, talking about this battle down throughout the ages. It speaks of this serpent who is what? The devil and Satan. And so we know for sure that when you have the serpent here, it is really... Satan speaking through this animal, co-opting and using this animal. And the hatred then is between first Satan and the woman. Satan always hated the woman. He always hated the human race. And now in this curse, it was the woman recognizing what has happened and hating Satan, as it were. Hating this one who deceived and who ultimately caused the world to plunge into darkness. Well, the promise also included enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. It says between your seed and her seed, which is difficult for us because we're like, how does the serpent have a seed? And, and what is the seed of the woman? If the seed of the woman is all men, what's the seed of the serpent? Demons? But it's clearly not that. Right? Something else involved. And so we need, again, the rest of the New Testament or the New Testament to reveal to us the nature of the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. What are these seeds? And by the way, this also introduces to us an extremely important hermeneutical concept, again, the study of the Bible, the science of the study of the Bible, right? Because found here in Genesis 3, and really then in multiple places, as we will see, you have this idea of a, a seed within a seed, a people within a people. All men are the seed of the woman physically, but not all are her seed spiritually. In this one verse, seed is used collectively, individually, and spiritually, not in a way that contradicts any of them, but one that complements each of these uses of the word seed are bound up in this prophecy and in this truth. Turn to Matthew 13. Because, again, we need some more insight as to who this seed is. What is the seed of the woman? What is the seed of the serpent? Matthew 13, Jesus tells a parable. So Matthew 13, 36. Then he, then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him and said, this is verse 36, explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. And he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So there you have it. 
given to us really in Jesus' parable. He said there are the sons of the devil, there are the sons of the, of the, of, uh, the son of man, sons of the kingdom. So you have these two seeds, these two races, as it were, within a race. Within the human race, there are two races. And this is very important to understand. The world denies this entirely. They will tell you over and over, we're all children of God. We're all sons of God. We're all underneath the truth of God. And that is true only to the extent that we are created by God. So that part is true. And the Bible speaks to that as well. There is this collective seed of everyone where the sons of God, in the sense of we were all created by him, and the Bible uses that sense. But in a fundamental sense, as it relates to our nature, see, that's our physicality. We were physically created by God. But when it comes to our nature, our, our spiritual nature, there are two races, the sons of the kingdom and the sons of the evil one. And the sons of the kingdom are the only ones then who will live forever, who will live with the king. The sons of the evil one are those, that, that parable goes on to say, who will be thrown into the furnace of fire in the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth at the end of the age. What's made even more clear for us in 1 John, turn there, the Apostle John reveals to us this idea of two seeds, both coming from the woman, and yet one spiritually dead and one spiritually alive. And, and John reveals to us that this happened again at the very beginning, from the get-go, right from Genesis 3. 1 John 3, 7. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. Yes, indeed, the world is trying to deceive you. Again, Satan always trying to do this, trying to level out the human race so there are, are no true sons of God. There are no sons of the devil. We're all the same. We're all underneath God. He's going to bless us all in the end. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. There you have it. That's the seed of Satan, the one who practices sin. The one for whom sin is their habitual nature as opposed to the one for whom righteousness now reflects their new nature. That's what, first, that's what John is saying. It says, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. There you have it, from this very time, really before this in his fall, and then certainly breaking into time, sinning by lying to Eve. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin again. No one who is born of God has as their perpetual nature, their ongoing practice to sin. Why? Because his seed abides in him. The Lord Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, abides in believers. And he cannot sin. That is, he cannot have a life that, is, that, is, that it demonstrates the habitual practice of sin. That is a sin nature that has not been overcome. And he cannot sin. Why? Because he's born of God. By this here we have it. The children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not from God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Here's the two seeds. The seeds of Satan, the seeds, the seed of the woman described here as the seed of Satan and the seed of God, the children of God. Now, this began very early. John reveals this to us as well. 1 John 3, 11. Now just move down in that text. Right? Where, where, when did this seed begin to differentiate? So as this promise is made, the seed of the woman versus the seed of Satan, how long did it take for there to develop a line that sought after God and a line that rejected God? The first children of Eve. Cain, the firstborn, becomes what? A child of the devil. Although the seed of the woman, in a physical sense, he becomes a seed of Satan because he hated God, rejected the commands of God in the form of sacrifice and the way that he was to worship, whereas Abel became the seed of the woman, the true spiritual seed, the one who sought after God because he obeyed the commands that God had given concerning how to worship and sacrifice to him. And there was then enmity between the woman and Satan the woman and the serpent, and then immediately between the seed of the woman, those who called on God, and the seed of the serpent, those who hated God, 1 John 3, 11 reveals this. For this is the message that we have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for re what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Yes, there is evil. And there is righteousness in this world. Every deed is not the same. Every person is not the same. And immediately after the curse, you have those who turned to God and those who did not. And the ones who turned to God that was demonstrated by responding to the man's God had given concerning his worship and sacrifice to him. That has been the way it is all down throughout, regardless of what system, whether it was the Old Testament sacrificial system, the pre-sacrificial system, as we see developed in Genesis chapter 3 and 4, or whether it is the response to Christ now in the New Testament, always there has been a proper response back to God in worship 
that he has commended and those who respond to that and in that way are the seed of the woman, are ultimately then the children of God. Do not be surprised, brethren, it goes on to say, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Here's the application. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. All men are God's children from the standpoint that he created them. That's what it says in James chapter 3. But they are certainly not all his children from a spiritual standpoint. And it is from this heritage that their eternal destiny is determined, heaven or hell. And that's promised at the very beginning. There is enmity then and has been continual enmity between the seed of the woman, those who love God, and the seed of Satan, those who hate God. But of course, this all came down, as we discussed last week, through an individual seed, through a particular seed. And so again, here we see the specific seed and also the collective seed. It says, he will bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. And so this was the promise of this seed of the woman, first collective, those who called upon God, and then through that line coming, one who would represent all of them in defeating the serpent and reversing the curse and putting in place the promise. The Messiah would be the seed of the woman. Certainly Luke one thirty four. As we now move again, it, as we're in the New Testament, how is this predicted? Well, it comes through the prediction of the of the angel Gabriel to the Virgin Mary. So you can look in Luke 1, verse 34, Mary said to the angel, and when he comes to predict that she will have a child, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you and for that reason, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. The Messiah, that the Messiah is the seed of the woman is very clear through the virgin birth. The angel says to Mary, there's no seed of man involved in this birth. The Holy Spirit causes the conception within her. And so this focus, this emphasis on the seed of the woman is carried through and really, really predicts or, or looks ahead to the fact that the Messiah would not come through man, would not come through the seed of a man, but through the seed of the woman and then conceived by the Holy Spirit so that this one is called the Son of God. And the verse that was already read this morning, Genesis 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law. So this prediction made in Genesis 3.15 then clearly car carried out through the virgin birth, no seed of man, seed of woman, and then also the, just the very nature of this promise that is, is reflected in Genesis 4.4. 4. He sent forth his son who was born of a woman. Again, that is emphasized. And again, let me say, just simply as an aside, the glory, the joy of, of, of this whole truth that the Messiah was born of a woman elevates womanhood in every way and elevates women in every way. Let us lay aside this idea that the Bible is somehow uh, derogatory against women in the, in the greatest way. It elevates them, even, even as it demonstrates the reality of the woman's sin at the beginning and through that very woman would come the salvation of the entire universe. Hebrews 2 14 really speaks then of this crushing in a direct way. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, that is the Messiah, Jesus, likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. There's the crushing. Satan's power is crushed. His ability to destroy is crushed. His he was given, been given power, as it were, over death to inflict death. And that power is ultimately destroyed in Christ. By the way, there is more to that crushing, but I can't talk about that this morning because that's next week. This crushing is not done. The crushing has begun. It will be culminated in a final crushing, but that's yet future Satan is, is being crushed now, but not that final crushing. All of the, of the necessary work for that, that total destruction of the evil one and all that he wrought is built into the work of Christ. And yet it isn't even finished. Now, fascinatingly enough, when you consider the seed of the woman crushing the head of the servant, that's individual, right? But it is also collective. Romans 16, 20. It says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Isn't that fascinating? So it is individual, this crushing, but it is also collective. Why? Because we are in Christ. 
And so we too are used of God then to bring about this crushing as we obey God and love God and proclaim the gospel. Do you realize that? This proclamation that you make on Christmas morning, that you will be celebrating to one another on Tuesday morning and that we make here, is part of the crushing of Satan. As the gospel goes forth and the people of God live for God, Satan is crushed in an ongoing way. It is as though we are stomping on his head every day of our lives. What an amazing, incredible thought. You have been given that power and that victory. Not in some strange way, not some unusual thing that you do or in incantations that you make or strange things that you might say, but by living for and loving Jesus and obeying and serving him and proclaiming the gospel, Satan is crushed. And so this is his fate, being crushed in an ongoing way, in an eternal way by the, by the one seed and then in an ongoing way by the collective seed as he is defeated through your obedience and proclamation. What a joy. What a total and complete crushing. He deceives Eve and yet then is defeated by the one who comes through Eve. But there's also, remember, the promised bruising of the woman's seed of the woman by the serpent. He will bruise you, you will bruise him on the heel. Not a crushing blow, not 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 a death blow, not a defeating blow, but nonetheless a strong blow, is it not? And this was true for the individual seed, Jesus, all throughout his life. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. You can just begin there, and you won't be able to turn to all of these. But so it keeps you in the New Testament, keeps you moving through. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, at the beginning of his ministry, it says Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be what? Tempted by the devil, tempted by the evil one. He's striking at his heel. These were real temptations. No, Jesus could not ultimately sin because he was God. And yet the temptations were real, fully experienced to their ultimate degree. Satan constantly striking then at Jesus to try to destroy him. In Luke 4.13, we know that at the end of that temptation, it says, when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. By the way, we know that through all of those 40 days Jesus was being tested. We only get the, really the record of the last three He was being tempted and tested the entire time, assaulted throughout those 40 days in his physical weakness with a culmination of those temptations coming that we see in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4. And yet it was then throughout the rest of his life that Satan was continually coming after him, striking at him, striking at his heel, seeking to destroy him if he could, and yet always defeated He's doing the same to the seed of woman now, to those who trust and love God now, to those who are the children of God. He's striking for all he's worth. And we continue to crush when we obey, when we seek after holiness and sanctification, as we live out the truths of the gospel. But of course, you know that there was more than that. That striking at the heel of the Messiah, the the, the individual seed is seen in very clear picture all throughout his passion, all throughout the, the, as he steps through to the cross. Luke 22, 2. The chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death, for they were afraid of the people. And Satan entered into Judas. Here we have the deceiver of all, the serpent. Satan himself. And by the way, he, Satan is not um, omnipresent. He's an individual. He's a created being. And so he can only be at certain places at certain times, one place at a time. And so he takes it upon himself to personally enter into Judas to accomplish this work, to strike at the heel of the Messiah, to destroy him. And he believes that he's going to do that. Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers that he might betray him to them. That voice speaking through Judas to work out the transaction for the 30 pieces of silver was the serpent himself indwelling Judas to make sure that this was done, to make sure that this was done properly. You want something done right? Do it yourself. And so that's exactly what Satan was doing. Luke twenty two fifty two. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and scribes and officers of the temple and elders who had come against him, have you come out with swords and clubs as you would against a robber? While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this hour and the power of darkness are yours. The striking of the serpent at the heel of the Messiah. All throughout this time, he was granted the power to do so. And so there we have the fulfillment in the New Testament of all, really, that, was, that has been mentioned in, in Genesis three fifteen. But of course, there's much more, so we go to the next one. The Messiah is the seed of Abraham. 
Well, that's promised certainly in the Old Testament. We read it in Genesis chapter 12, that Abraham would have a land and a seed and a blessing, a personal blessing, yes, but that, that blessing would then extend to the entire world. Well, how is that to be? How does the New Testament say that that took place? Turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3. Don't get tired. Keep turning. Because there's so much to be seen. We can only begin to touch the surface of these things. I mean, we're getting the, the very most basic overview as we consider these truths. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Now, again, very fascinating. Almost exactly as the prediction in Genesis 3 of the seed of the woman, we have here a, a collective nature of the seed. And Paul in verse 16 here, bringing out the individual nature of the seed of Abraham. So bound up in Abraham's seed and that promise, we have a collective promise to all who would come to the nation of Israel and then to the, collect, or then to the individual seed, to Christ. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say unto seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. Although Abraham did have a collective seed, that is the Jews and, and the covenant people that they were, and they did inherit promises, the means by which those promises were obtained were from the one seed of Abraham, Christ. Paul is not denying a collective understanding of the seed. He is saying that the final referent of that promise to Abraham is the seed, Christ himself, just as the final referent of the seed of the woman was Jesus himself. So we see the same hermeneutical principles being worked out, a collective understanding and an individual understanding. There's both a physical and a spiritual nature of these seeds all the way down throughout and then Genesis 3, 13 and 14, just back up two verses, several verses. The seed of Abraham, Christ, enabled the blessing of Abraham to come to the Gentiles. So the Bible proves that that seed was Christ that was predicted and then demonstrates how that promise moves from Abraham to the Gentiles. Again, there is a very specific physical nature to that seed, the Jews. And then there had to be a movement of the promise from that physical seed to a spiritual seed without undoing the nature of the physical seed, and that's through Christ. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus, the seed, the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. It is very fascinating that Paul says it comes to the Gentiles, then he refers back to the Jews, we and the Jews and Gentiles collectively to say, through Christ, the promise of the Spirit of God comes to both Jews and Gentiles. Fascinating, powerful, a promise fulfilled. The only way you could move from the covenant ethnic people to then a covenant spiritual people again, without the erasing of the covenant promises to the ethnic people, as we will see, is through these very promises, through this understanding of, the, of Christ as the ultimate seed who brings this blessing to, all, to the Gentiles, all who will believe. This in no way indicates that the Gentiles have replaced the original covenant seed or fulfilled them simply that the promises have now been extended past them to us, and you celebrate that at Christmas. You're not Jews. I, there might be some of you here who are ethnic Jews, but you know, almost none of you are. Why do you get this blessing? Because of Christ. Because of the gift given to you. And because of the specific promises made. But I tell you, not apart from the Jews. Not apart from that collective seed. Not apart from the work that God did with them, but because of them. And because then of Christ who came through that ethnic seed to provide for us a spiritual seed. Well, we continue on. The Messiah is of the tribe of Judah. How is that then fulfilled in the New Testament? That's the promise made. Before there was even a nation of Israel, the 12 sons, Jew, uh, Jacob makes a promise to them in Genesis 49.10, we saw, and he promises something for each son, a prophetic demonstration of what would happen to those tribes really throughout history. And he says to Judah, not the firstborn, but the fourthborn, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, the ruler's staff from between his feet. There will be a king, he says, and that king will come through the line of Judah, not as would be expected through the line of Reuben, the firstborn. And how do we see that in the New Testament? Well, in many ways, but I'll just read you one verse in Revelation chapter 5, so don't turn there. We'll be continuing to look at some other things, but Revelation 5, 5. One of the elders said to me, this is John, as he is in the spirit reporting what is going to be happening at the end. And all of these things are wrapped up. And again, we can only go to about Revelation 5. We can't go past that because Revelation 6, 7, that's next week. Right? That's coming. 
He says, one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. So again, the New Testament reveals to us the fulfillment of this promise in Jesus who is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. No, no promise left unfulfilled and really no promise left unmentioned. No unimportant promise. All of them relate to our confidence that this is truly the right Messiah. We'd best have the right Savior. We'd best have the one who can truly save us. We'd best not put our hope in some other Messiah, some other Savior. And so all of these promises relate to the reality of, the truth of, and the effectual work of a true Savior. He was predicted to be of the tribe of Judah, so he must be of that, and he is our lion. He is the one who saves us who is worthy to open the books to really end all of eternity, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Next, the Messiah is the great prophet. Remember the Old Testament promise in Deuteronomy 18, there will come a prophet like me. Listen to him. Establishing, again, fascinating, establishing a group of people, prophets, who really find their culmination in one person, the great prophet, the Lord Jesus. Well, how is that prophecy spoken through Moses that there would arise a great prophet? Well, how do we know that's fulfilled? Again, New Testament. The Jewish people understood Moses' statement in Deuteronomy 18 to refer to the Messiah. And this was made very clear when they asked John the Baptist if he is Elijah or the prophet, John 1.21. They asked him, what then, are you Elijah? The forerunner, or one who would be a forerunner. He said, I am not. He said, are you the prophet? Who would that refer to? The one that Moses promised. Not any prophet, Elijah was a prophet. Not the great prophet the prophet, the one who would arise like Moses, to whom the people should listen. That's very important. This prediction, Moses' prediction, he says, look, you, you, don't, you don't listen to me. I'm giving you the second law of Deuteronomy. I'm telling you again the truth of the law, but you've never listened to me. There's a prophet coming, and you'd better listen to him. You should have listened to me. You should have done all that I told you to do, but you haven't, and you don't, and you won't until the great prophet comes. You had best listen to him. And, and I, I say that to you this morning. You had best listen to this prophet. You should have listened to all the prophets. You should have known all that they said. You should have understood what they said. But you'd better listen to this one, the ultimate prophet, the one who is truly God. John six fourteen, we see a similar thing. When the people saw the sign that he'd performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world, even though they didn't ultimately then listen to him. And probably the greatest explanation or demonstration of the reality of this prophecy. Oh, one other thing, in Acts 7.37, just as an aside for free, Stephen uses this quote as well because he was told by the Pharisees they're stoning him because he denied the prophets and he's denying Moses. And he, he quotes them this prophecy that said there will arise a prophet like me, listen to him as they're stoning him, as they're about to stone him to death, proving that he loved Moses and he loved the prophets and he was the only one faithful to them or he was being, whereas the Pharisees and scribes were disobeying the one thing Moses told them to do or at least the greatest thing that he told them, obey this prophet who will come. Anyway, Hebrews 1. Go ahead and turn there. I'll give you a moment. Hebrews 1. This is God after he spoke long ago to the fathers, in the prophets, in many portions, and in many ways. In these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he, this Son, is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is the great prophet, the one who finally speaks for God because he is God. He is the final word. Well, the Messiah is the Davidic king. It's an Old Testament promise we looked at, the Davidic covenant, which is in effect. And again, all the groundwork laid for that, the Davidic rule laid for all that done or, or accomplished in the work of Christ. That Old Testament prophet in Second Samuel or prophecy in Second Samuel seven twelve. Well, how is this prophecy that there would be a king in the line of David fulfilled? Turn to Matthew one. In Matthew chapter one, as we began the study of Matthew, I don't know, a bunch of years ago now, I can't even say how many. I think it was three. All right, maybe four. In Matthew chapter one, we began with this. There's a genealogy. Don't you love genealogies? No. Uh, usually not. You read them in the, what you do in the Old Testament when you read them is you just quickly thumb your way through them and maybe look for highlights like Jabez or something like that. 
But in Matthew, we have a genealogy. Why? They're, they're given to us to demonstrate that God works through his people. He works through individuals and he works through lineages, people, peoples that he has promised. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, there you have it. He is the Messiah, claimed by Matthew, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then he works his way down through the genealogy, actual real people that lived, that came from David's lineage, his seed, physical seed. And so Jesus is that, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. And then in Luke 1.31, as the angel reports these things to Mary, he says, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. He's the physical line of David. He, is the, 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 he carries with it the authoritative line of kings through Joseph. And our best understanding is that he also has the actual physical seed of, jo- of David through Mary. But that's why the genealogy in Luke chapter 2 is different. That that's Mary's genealogy. So he's both the authoritative and legal heir of the kings through Joseph and the physical heir of David through Mary. Next, the Messiah is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Remember that Old Testament promise? You need a new priest. You have a better covenant? You've got to have a better priest. You have a different kind of priesthood. The Aaronic priesthood will not do because it reflects the old covenant that was passing away. So you need a new one. Well, Psalm 110 says this. The Lord has sworn, will not change his mind. You're a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. How does that get demonstrated in the New Testament? Well, you should already know, right? The book of Hebrews. Thank you. Turn there, Hebrews chapter 5. All right, so this does get brought back up again. Not an unimportant prophecy, a very important one. And I, I do find it fascinating that any prophecy of Jesus or about Jesus that we need to know is revealed to us in the New Testament. You don't have to invent them. You don't have to go back into the Old Testament and try to figure out, I wonder if that's a prophecy of Jesus. Just look at the New Testament. It will tell you. And all of the ones that you need to know about are recorded by the New Testament writers. Don't make up other ones. Don't come and say, well, I think this was a prophecy of Jesus. I'm sure of it, so bank, bank on it. If the New Testament doesn't say it, why do you need that? You don't. Everything you need to know about promises made, promises made in the Old Testament is revealed to you in the New. That's what it's for. I mean, Matthew goes out of his way to quote Old Testament passages that say, and say, this is the fulfillment, but he doesn't quote the whole Old Testament. He doesn't use the story of David and Goliath to say this demonstrates the substitutionary atonement because it doesn't. And he doesn't need to do that. Every place that we need to know of from the Old Testament where Jesus is referenced, it is referenced for us in the New Testament. Sweet. We have everything you need. Don't invent them. Enjoy the ones that are there and enjoy the Old Testament for what it is. Jesus concealed, promised, in shadows, clearly revealed in the New Testament. Hebrews 5, 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Just as he says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And then Hebrews seven eleven. Now if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for it is on the basis, for on the basis of it, the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not designated according to the order of of Aaron. In Christ, we have the truly perfect high priest, one who is human like us, but perfect like God, one who intercedes for us concerning sin, but does so on the basis of his own sacrifice and not on the basis of another, one who then can intercede for us perfectly and eternally before the Father. That's why he needed to be of the order of Melchizedek. And it's fascinating that in Hebrews, he he, he tells the people, the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who it was. He says, you become dull. You don't even understand these things. You don't even understand why this would be necessary. And some of you are going, I didn't even know that was necessary. It's time to know these things. It's time to know your Bible, Old and New Testament. How often do you read the Old? You should read it all the time, constantly working your way through it. Why do you read the New? You're not going to understand the New until you have read through the Old. You don't really understand it. You can see the things there, but you're like, Melchizedek, who's that? What was that? How do we even know about that? And the author of Hebrews castigates the people for not knowing those things. That's not deeper theology. That's something that scholars know, pastors know that. You should know that. You're the congregation. You're the people who know and love Jesus. You're the ones who make the proclamation of him. You're on the front lines declaring to people the reality of the gospel. You've got to know your Bibles. That's what we're doing. That's why I'm doing this. So you will know your Bibles. You're not going to go, well, that was great. Chris did that. You're supposed to do that. 
And you can do that because it's all right here. I didn't make any of it up. I'm not doing anything special. I'm not doing special hermeneutics. I don't know secret deep typology that nobody else knows. It says it right here and explains it exactly. It's exactly what it means, exactly what it's for. You can read it. You can understand it. You don't have to go to seminary. Nothing wrong with going to seminary. You don't got to go. It's right here. I love it. It's sweet. The Messiah will be born of a virgin. Ooh, we must move on. Born of a virgin. Now this, this you know, right? Every, I just read you Luke 2, so you know this already, but again, what a sweet thing. In Isaiah, 400, 600 years before this virgin birth is made, and when there had never been, because there cannot be, a virgin birth. It's impossible. So he makes this impossible prediction, an impossible amount of years ahead of time, and it happens exactly. Matthew chapter 1, turn there. Matthew 1. Oh, there's so much here. Because this virgin birth actually created for Mary and Joseph the greatest of problems. Why created for you eternal life, it created for them a life of sorrow, a life of rejection by their family. Because Jesus, for his entire life, and thus Mary and Joseph, were tainted by this thought that he was an illegitimate child. Why? Because there is no such thing as a virgin birth, except or Jesus. So when Mary is with child, what has happened? By her closest family, by Joseph himself, there is only one thing that can be surmised. She has been unfaithful. And only one thing that can be surmised by the people outside of Mary and Joseph, that they have been unfaithful. And this is thrown back at him all throughout his life. And when he starts his ministry, the Pharisees say, we're not illegitimate children. I think you see echoes of it in the very Christmas story itself when there is no room for them in the house. And it's not the word for in, it's the word for house. Whose house? His own family's house. All of the family of Joseph would have been in Bethlehem, all of them. Every extended family member there. And they rejected them and would not even give them a bed to put the Messiah in. They stuck them in a stable out in a cave so that Jesus was born in a manger. His own family from the very be- earliest times rejected him as illegitimate. Let us not make the same mistake this morning that we would reject him as the illegitimate Messiah, the wrongful Savior. There is only one. Matthew one twenty. Joseph discovers Mary's pregnant, and he's a righteous man. He's going to put her away. He doesn't want to marry someone who's been unfaithful. It's right and good, by the way. That, that was a right thing for him to do. And yet, when he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David... Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. The virgin birth makes possible the reality of the incarnation. Jesus is both truly and fully man and truly and fully God. We say this according to what was sometimes called the Chalcedonian formula, the Council of Chalcedon. The divine and human natures are united in Christ without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. He is truly our Savior because he is both man and God, the only one who can save. Well, the Messiah is the mighty God. We saw that last week, Isaiah 9, 6. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. Well, how do we know that he's the Mighty God? Turn to John 1, 1. John 1, 1. How does the New Testament reveal to us? Well, of course, already in the fact that he was conceived of God, right? He's conceived in the womb of Mary. So we see all of that. But it is made crystal clear for us in John 1, 1 that this Messiah is fully and truly God himself. By the way, John doesn't give us an account of the incarnation directly, right? The physical incarnation. He tells us what went on spiritually. He tells us what was really happening when Jesus came. In the beginning, John 1, 1 was the Word, Jesus. The Word was with God. The Word was God, an individual personage, and yet fully and completely God. That is, all of the essence of deity, and yet with an individual personality. The word was with God, the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, eternal like God, powerful like God, exactly like God, except an individual, Jesus. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Jump down to verse 14, and the word became flesh 
and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the most high God. He is fully God. Hebrews 1 8, but, the, but of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. God himself declares that Jesus is God and that his throne is forever. The entire New Testament testifies to the nature of Jesus as the mighty God. The I am statements of Jesus, the fact that he forgave sins, the reality that all judgment has been given to him by the Father, and his death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf. Well, Jesus is the man of sorrows, a suffering servant. We saw that in Isaiah 53. And you, of course, know how that was fulfilled. All throughout his life, he was a man of sorrows. Claimed to be illegitimate. Seemingly losing his father at, at, at some age, it would appear possibly early. Hated by his brothers. Rejected by them. They did not believe in him. And then seen, of course, most clearly in his agony in the garden. Matthew twenty six thirty eight. My soul is deeply grieved. His betrayal by his own disciples. Luke twenty two forty eight. Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Deserted by nearly all his disciples, Matthew 26, 56. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Denied by Peter, Luke 22, 60. Man, said Peter, I do not know what you're talking about. And Jesus, the Lord, looked and turned, turned and looked at Peter. Scourged, a crown of thorns, hit and spat upon. John 19, 1. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns. They took Jesus and scourged him. They began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews, and to give him slaps on the face. He was rejected by his own people. Pilate brings him out and says, Behold your king. In John 19, 14, they cried out, Away with him. Their own Messiah. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. What a joke. And this is what the world claims. He's rejected by the very ones he created, by the very ones who died for, and they stand today and say, We will have no king. We have no king but ourselves. No king but what we can say, what we can think, what our science can put together. How foolish. No king but science. No king but some philosopher. No king but some earthly king. It's ridiculous. And yet he was rejected in this way. Reviled in shame by the religious leaders and passers-by in Matthew 27, 39 through 44. They were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads at him. The one who was saving them. And again they do the same today invectives against Jesus, using his name as a curse word. The one who died for them, a man of sorrows indeed, was our Savior. The greatest, however, forsaken by God. Forsaken by his own Father in ways that we don't understand. Never the Trinity broken, nothing weird like that, but nonetheless, in a very real way, Matthew 15, 34, and in the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the wrath of God was being poured out upon him for our sake. He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And he gave up his spirit in death. He died, the actual real death. Not forced upon him by the circumstance, but brought about by himself as he gives up his own spirit. Luke 23, 46, Jesus crying out with his loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Well, we saw the prediction that the Messiah would save his people from their sins. The Old Testament promise again in Isaiah 53 and other places, this substitutionary atonement. And we see it fulfilled in the New Testament everywhere. 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you are healed. The verse I just quoted to you, 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we would become, might become the righteousness of God in him. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. He is our substitutionary sacrifice. He is the one who took God's wrath and gave us his own righteousness. That's what you celebrate. What a gift. Everything about salvation is a gift. For by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. The that not of yourselves, the faith, the justification, everything bound up in sanctification or or in, in salvation is a gift from God, including the very faith to believe. 
all of that granted to you as he took your sin and your penalty and God's wrath and gave you God's blessing and God's delight and God's eternity and God's righteousness. That's a gift. And you could never earn it and you could never deserve it. And it doesn't matter how many times you've sat in church or how many times you've read your Bible or how many nice things you've done for other people or how many good gifts you've given or how many nice things you've said or what family you grew up in or what nation you are a part of. Apart from this gift given to you by God himself, you cannot be saved. Nothing you could do will ever earn it. No faith of your own will purchase it. It's a faith given and a salvation given, granted to you so that you might be saved. The Messiah is the mediator, is mediating the new covenant. Just no time. Uh, it's very clear that he's doing that, so I'll just uh, look at that, the, the old covenant, Jeremiah 31. In Luke 22, verse 20, in the same way he took the cup after he'd eaten, saying, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. He is mediating that covenant. Hebrews 9, 15, for this reason also, he is, not would be, not later, not, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. Yes, for Israel in a final way to come as God's ethnic people. But for us today, he is the mediator of a new covenant. And then we're almost there, the last two. The easiest ones, maybe. That the Messiah had a forerunner, and that was John the Baptist. I, really, I should say, he had and has. <laughs> there's, there's another one, but that's for next week as well. Malachi 3.1 said that there would be a forerunner, one who would clear the way before him. John the Baptist did this, Luke one seventy six. Zacharias promises this of his son, You, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of God. Matthew 3, 1 says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness through Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet. There had to be a forerunner. Why? Because the people didn't think that they were sinners. They were Jews. They were covenant people. Their sin was covered by the sacrificial system and so they were fine. They were in the kingdom. And the forerunner comes to tell them that they are personally and individually those who have fallen short of the glory of God regardless of their ethnic heritage. And unless they believed John, they did not trust in Jesus. Unless they repented of sin, they could not and would not trust in what Jesus had done. It is essential. Repentance and faith are flip sides of the same coin, both essential parts of what salvation truly is and both of them gifts of God. If you do not believe this morning that you are a sinner deserving of eternal hell, you cannot be saved. You cannot slap onto your life a belief in a Messiah that you think provided salvation when you don't know the reason you need it. It's impossible. A mental assent about Jesus will never save a recognition of your need of Christ, granted you by the Spirit of God through the Word of God, and a clinging to Jesus by faith, granted to you through the Word of God by the Spirit of God, will bring salvation and that alone. And then lastly, the Messiah was born in Bethlehem. He will never be born again, so that one is totally done. Nothing new, no no more on that one. But it's important. It's important. All of this reminds us that there was a real physical place where he was born, a real Messiah. All of this happened in history. Matthew 2, 5. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for that is what has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem of Judah, are by no means least among all the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd his people Israel. Now before you shut down, I know Christmas is on your minds. I've kept you long. Well, not really all that long. Do you know, listen to me carefully, Do you know who said the words that I just read? Who said the words that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem? Those who had studied the scriptures, they knew where the Messiah would be born. They said it to a group of kings or king makers who came came from the east. They said it to them almost casually when they asked, where would the Messiah be born? They said, he'll be born in Bethlehem. That's where he's going to be born. And did that group of people go with those king makers, those those magi from the east, to go and see and worship the Messiah, they did not. They believed that the Old Testament spoke of the Messiah. But they did not believe that the Messiah would come in the way that he did. 
and they refused to bend the knee. And they refused to bend the knee to him to this day. Why? Because they hold the right, hear me, they believe they hold the right to determine how the Messiah will come and what he will be like. Are you doing the same? Well, he hasn't granted me my desires. He took away my mother or father. He allowed the harm of my children. He's not the Messiah that I want. The Messiah does not come as you want. He does not come according to your determination. He comes according to the predictions of and the truth of Scripture alone. Put away your thoughts about what the Savior ought to be. Put away your thoughts as to what he ought to do for you or how he should have come. Instead, believe how he did come and who he truly was. The evidence is overwhelming. To believe, to, to disbelieve this morning is an active disbelief which rejects the facts and rejects the reality of who Jesus is. So if you do not believe this morning, then go away knowing that you have purposely and actively resisted the truth that was presented to you this morning. But if you do believe, and as you have believed, might you go not only rejoicing in this truth, but not proclaiming your own Messiah, not proclaiming what you believe the Messiah to be, but proclaiming what the Bible says that he is, Old and New Testaments, Genesis to Revelation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the precious privilege of studying your word this morning, just touching the surface of, of what this word has to tell us about who you are. We thank you. This is a living word, animated by, illuminated by, empowered by your spirit. And Father, I pray that that word would have been powerful this morning. I confess that my efforts in this regard are absolutely worthless apart from the work of your spirit in the hearts of each one who has heard. And, and Father, knowing that, each of us, we, we humbly ask that you would do that work that we cannot, illuminating and empowering this word to us. Father, for those here who do not, who have not truly believed in you, might they bend the knee this morning, rejoicing to take hold of the gift that you have given. And might this first Christmas be for them the greatest of all. Father, for us who know you and love you, but only by your grace and only because of your gift, might we have a special, joyful, increasingly wondrous Christmas experience as we reflect and remember what you've done. In your precious name, Lord Jesus, amen. Go forth and prepare for Christmas.